accepted by you. Let us ride on the wings of our praises and refresh our spirits in you. As we begin today, guide us towards your will. We ask these things in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. My name is Emmy Markham, and if you're visiting with us for the first time, we would like to extend to you a special welcome. We are so glad you chose to come and worship Christ with us this morning, and we would love to meet you after service. <clears throat> if you look inside your bulletin, you'll find a white connection card. Every week we ask you to fill this card out. This helps us stay connected. You are invited to list your prayer needs so that we as the body of Christ can lift each other up in prayer. Please fill this out and drop it in the offering plate later in the service. The announcements are listed in the bulletin. I would like to highlight two of them for you this morning. Today is a first Sunday, a communion Sunday, and we want to give those of you who feel led a special opportunity to give to our benevolence fund. This is a special emergency fund within the church overseen by our finance team that helps people going through times of unusual financial hardship. If you would like to give over and above your tithe, you can bring your gift down to the prayer rail or the communion table as you receive Holy Communion. <clears throat> Please give to the 30-hour fam famine to fight against world hunger. Checks can be made out to World Vision and can be placed in the offering plate. For more information, contact Matt Dietrich. There are several other important announcements in the bulletin. Please take a few moments to read through those. Now I invite you to stand and join with me in our congregational reading from Psalm 18. Today's responsive reading is from Psalm 18, 1 through 3, and 46 through 50. Please join me in reading responsibly. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. Refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted by the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who delivered me from my enemies. Indeed, who exalted me above my adversaries, you delivered me from the Bible. For this I will extol you, the Lord among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great triumphs he gives to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Now please greet your neighbor, neighbor in the peace of the Lord. Come back. It's good. <laughs> He's got to go get the bus ready. Oh. <laughs> He's in between bus rides. There you go. <laughs>
chosen one. I believe I overcome by the power of His blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because He i
God's people said, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We are going to be invited into our prayer time here in just a moment. And um, if you uh, received a bulletin on the way in, just a reminder that uh, inside your bulletin there's a printed list of names of different individuals, different families and situations uh, we've been asked to keep in our prayers, not only today, but throughout the course of the week as well. Um, ever have one of those weeks where the highs are really high and the lows are really low? For a lot of us, this past week has been one of those weeks with some great mountaintop moments and some deep valley moments. And so our, uh, our prayer time is kind of uh, it's in, inspired, instructed by that. And the prayer is going to be a little bit different today. And I'll explain that here in a minute. I want to share several um, kind of deep needs with you as well as several <laughs> wonderful celebrations. So I'll start with the deep needs uh, first. We've had a lot of sickness, a lot of folks out this week, and deaths in our uh, broader church family. So it's been a kind of a heaviness uh, around this place, uh, but also some, some great joys as well. We want to remember in our prayers, uh, one of our uh, retired pastors, Pastor Richard, has been sick. Uh, so there will not be a 6 p.m. service tonight. He was scheduled to lead that service, so he's sick. We're taking a break tonight for the 6 p.m. service. We want to pray for the family of, of Mike Snyder. Now, this is not former pastor Mike Snyder. This is an older couple in our church, Mike and Mary Snyder. Mary passed away, and we want to pray for Mike and the, the family uh, as they are grieving this loss. I also want to pray for the family of Donna Comley. Donna's mother, Ruby, passed away. Her service was yesterday. Also, I want to pray for the family of Helen Black upon her death uh, earlier this past week. So um, a, lot of, a lot of hurt, a lot of uh, heaviness in our congregation with these uh, recent deaths. I want to pray continually for uh, Charlie Nicholson. I've mentioned him the last couple weeks. So the last time I shared about him, he was out of the hospital. Well, he's gone back in the hospital, so prayers uh, for Charlie as well. Um, on, a, on a happier note, we have several things to, uh, to celebrate. Um, as we've had some folks in and out this week, we've had some amazing other staff and volunteers step in to help. So many, many thanks uh, to Debbie Mallory for pulling extra duty on music. Uh, a lot of thanks to, uh, to Gary Mata for leading singing this morning and doing an amazing Maybe the best version of His Eyes on the Sparrow I've ever heard. He's in the back of the room blushing right now. But Gary, amazing job. It was truly awesome. Um, and also, uh, many thanks uh, to Pam Browning. Uh, Pam stepped in and covered a whole lot of bases this week as other staff were out of the office. So uh, a lot of thanks there. We had a pretty amazing Ash Wednesday service this past Wednesday. The beginning, the kickoff, if you will, to the season of Lent. We're doing some Lenten small groups uh, throughout the next uh, six weeks or so, and uh, it's not too late to join up with one of those. If you are interested, uh, you can write that on your connection card. Just put Lent small group, and we'll try to get you plugged into a group uh, later this week. Um, and today at this service, and then also at the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have help serving communion uh, from some members of our confirmation class. So we're glad to have them uh, helping to lead and serve uh, this morning as well. So uh, some exciting things, and also some heavy moments uh, in our life as an extended family of faith this past week. The prayer this week is, uh, at least the first part of it, is informed, if you will, uh, by one of the Psalms. And I picked a Psalm of Thanksgiving, and that seems kind of weird maybe, but in my experience, um, when you go through difficult times, the, the highs and the lows, they all get jumbled together. One of the things that believers have done over the years is uh, have chosen, chosen to be thankful, uh, choosing the attitude of gratitude, if, if you will. So I've, I've found uh, some excerpts from Psalms in the Old Testament um, that we're going to kind of pray through as a part of our prayer time, where we just choose to be thankful, thankful for the high, but also thankful for the, for the low. And as weird as that sounds, the reason we're thankful for the lows is that we're reminded God is with us then too. Not just on the mountaintop, but also in the valley. God walks with us through all of these things. And for that, we, we choose to be thankful. So I would invite you this morning, just to, let's humble our hearts and let's bow our heads and let's go before our amazing God as we pray. And again, let's choose to be thankful. Whatever we're going through, we, we choose to be thankful to God in, in this moment. 
Friends, let's go before the throne of grace and pray in the name of Jesus. Would you join me as we pray today? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we remember the words of your scripture when the psalmist wrote, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, we call upon your name. Lord, you make your deeds known amongst your people. We give thanks today, Lord, because you are good and your steadfast love, it endures forever. You and you alone are the God of our salvation. And you gather us and you rescue us from among the nations. We give thanks to your holy name and we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Lord, you are our strength and our shield. In you and you alone, our hearts trust. From generation to generation to generation, we will recount your praises and give you thanks. For you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us. And we thank you for the high and holy moments. And Lord, we thank you even for the dark valley moments. Lord, we thank you that your light is the light that leads us out of the darkness. And your strength is what pulls us out of the depths. We thank you, Lord, that we face no situation alone because you are with us. And in fact, you've walked a couple steps ahead of us. You know what's ahead. You have blazed the path. And you ask us to follow in obedience and faithfulness, step by step after you. So Father, in these moments, we strengthen our hearts, we ratchet up our resolve, and we determine we are gonna follow you the next step and the next step and the next, whatever that might be. Where we are weak, lift us up. Where we fail, catch us. Where we stumble, Lord, don't let us fall. We thank you, Lord, for each person gathered here today in our time of worship, for the larger church, the different worship services, the different gatherings, the different outreach ministries, Lord. So many things happening in and through this group of people. We pray, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Lord, that this place would be ground zero of your work here in Nicholasville and Jessamine County, reaching out and serving and pointing the way to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we claim that you are our hope. When we feel hopeless, you are the hope we cling to. When we are lost, you are our guide. <coughs> Father, when our strength fails, you lift us up. We pray for those who are sick and suffering that your healing touch would be upon them and your spirit would rest in them. For those who grieve, we pray for your comfort and your joy and your love just to surround them. For those who are struggling, Father, we pray, lift their spirits and turn their eyes to you. And Father, where we are lost, just confused, out of our element, put your compass in our hearts to point us back to you. We give you this day, we give you our worship, all for your glory. All these things we ask and all these things we pray in the mighty and awesome and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And with one heart and one voice, all God's people said, amen. This time we invite our ushers to come forward and collect this morning's offering. Left his throne to wake as 
a child, he became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him. <laughs> he who died with sinners and saints healed the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him. He who chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our debt, buried death as to life he rose. Behold him. Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion, all oh, be still and behold him, Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down, were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he, had, what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one, no one any of the things they had seen. The word of God for the people of God. Today is a first Sunday, a communion Sunday, 
which means um, I'm going to share a little devotional thought with you and uh, say a short prayer over the elements, over the bread and the cup. And the kind of our, our act of worship today that we kind of culminate with is inviting folks to receive Holy Communion. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Basically, uh, today is special. We're going to have some of our communion class to come. We're going to serve them, and they'll help to serve you all. I always try to remember to say this. This is not my table or a United Methodist table. It is the Lord's table, and anyone is welcome and invited to receive and participate. We come with uh, hearts that are humble. We come repenting of our sins, and we come desiring to be in peace with God and with, with one another. This is the spirit in which we approach the table. Let me share the blessing over the table and then a little devotional thought with you. You might remember in the scriptures that the night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with his followers in an upper room. And they celebrated a Passover meal together. And when the meal was over, Jesus took bread. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. A little later on today, when people are invited to, to come and receive, we do have some, some gluten-free wafers right here on the, the plate, if that would be helpful to you. When the meal was over that night, Jesus took the cup. And he poured it out for his followers and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. All these years later, we celebrate and remember this meal, the bread, reminding us of the body of Christ that was broken for us and the cup reminding us of the blood of Christ that was shed for us. A couple of months ago, we celebrated Holy Communion, and in the 11 o'clock service that particular day, we had some visitors from out of state, and as we were serving the, uh, the, uh, the line at the 11 o'clock service, the fellow came down front and kind of whispered and said, is this real wine? And I, no, it's, it's, just, it's just Welch's grape juice, that, that's all it is, but uh, not being from around here, he didn't know the tradition, so... Um, if, if we left this on the table for about a month, it might be real wine. But this, this was freshly, freshly poured earlier, earlier today. Again, friends, in a few moments, the invitation is that anyone who wants to receive and remember and celebrate what Jesus did for us in the sacrament is welcome and invited to do so. Pray with me for just a moment. Almighty God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body and the blood of Christ for the world. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to share a little story with you as a part of our invitation today. And it's kind of a, uh, an orientation or a get-your-bearings kind of moment story. In many ways, the sacrament of Holy Communion reorients our hearts back to God and back to what Jesus did for us on the cross. Um, I know many of you all, uh, like me, get emails, and your inbox gets full of emails, and sometimes you do that discipline of just delete, 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 delete. And you, you, know, you may or may not read all the emails. Does anybody else do that? I never delete your emails when they come to me. But, you know, you go through the list and sometimes, well, I was doing that this past week and there was an email uh, from Aldersgate Camp. That's one of our Methodist church camps here in Kentucky. It caught my attention. It, it was a Lent devotional themed email. And I don't usually read all of those, but this one I did read and it was kind of cool. It was kind of reminding me of, of a story from many years ago. Um, how many folks in, in the service here uh, ha have been... Uh, to Aldersgate Camp, or are familiar with Aldersgate Camp. It's over in Estill County, Kentucky, several folks. Okay, so you might, th this might speak to you a little bit. And, well, I'll let you all decide that. Um, so I'm reading this email lit devotional. And let me read the first paragraph, the first two paragraphs to you. I'm quoting here. 
One day I set out with a couple of former summer, summer camp counselors to explore the cabin in the woods. Have you ever done this trail at Aldersgate? It's unofficial. It's not on any map. We were told to look for an old trash pile on the ground and in a tree. We looked and we bushwhacked for hours, but never did we find the famed cabin in the woods. Sure would have been nice to have had a map. Next paragraph. Our journeys in faith can often feel like this too. So much wandering <laughs> with no clear direction, looking for any way marker along the way we can find. But our Christian faith is full of good news. The good news also means that Jesus Christ came before us to show us the way. Now the devotional went on. Let me just stop reading right there. So I read that part of the email, and something inside of me just went, uh huh? You know, like Scooby Doo? Uh huh? And I thought back, I have been to the famed cabin in the woods. And actually, I'm pretty sure that this tells you how old I am. About 30 years ago, me and another camp staff, a guy named Brad Smart, who's a pastor and now district superintendent in Eastern Kentucky, we, we found this place on a lark. I know you're dying for me to tell you how we found it, so I'll tell you real quick. And those of you familiar with Aldersgate, you can imagine a little bit, and you'll probably, well, I so say you'll think of me differently after I tell you the story. But let me just tell you the story. So one weekend, camp was over. All the campers had gone home. Many of the camp staff had gone home for a day. You know, you come back the next day to start over again. <laughs> Myself and a few others decided to stay the weekend. It was a beautiful weekend, sunny. We had this big plan. We're going to go hiking and exploring for a day, and then we'll come back and drive into uh, either Irvine and eat at the Cedar Village, or if we really were living large, we'd drive into Richmond and go to Red Lobster because that was big time living when you're 20 years old and working on summer camp staff. Some of you can kind of imagine. So me and Brad decided we're just going to go exploring one day. So we, <laughs> we said, we're going to just follow a creek as far as it goes back into the woods and just see what we can find. Now, 20, uh, 30 years ago, that seemed like a good idea. Now you probably wouldn't do that. But... We, we picked the creek that ha happened to go back to the outpost camp area, and some of you might know where that is. And we decided we're just going to follow this creek as far as we can go. So we followed this creek, I don't know, probably a quarter of a mile, half a mile back through the woods, or uh, between two kind of mountain ridges. Uh, out west, you'd call it a box canyon. In Kentucky, we call it a holler. And the holler got narrower and narrower and narrower, and finally, as we followed this creek, lots of different tributaries, we stayed on the main creek, we came to a waterfall, about a 15-foot waterfall. Cliff here, cliff here, waterfall. We thought, man, trip's over. But no, we were young and in shape and foolish, and we climbed the waterfall, about 20 foot. And now, I've done rock climbing before. This was not rock climbing. This is more scrambling. Uh, there's a difference. We just kind of scramble our way up this waterfall. At the top, the valley widened out again. There's another kind of box canyon or holler, but we were at the top now. We followed this creek, another, I don't know, quarter mile, half a mile back through the woods, and came to another box canyon, a horseshoe-shaped holler, cliffs about 30 to 40 feet tall all around. We thought, ah, oh, trip's over, but no, we're 20 years old, foolish in shape. We found a rock slide climbed up the rock slide, shimmied onto a ledge, shimmy, the important word there, found a tree leaning over, grabbed onto the tree. Kids, do not do this, by the way. Grabbed onto a tree, pulled ourselves up with the tree and the ledge, and hopped ledges all the way to the top of this thing. I couldn't do that now, by the way, but 30 years ago, easy peasy. At the top of this, we're on a ridge now, a big wide ridge. And in front of us, there's a huge trash dump, like cars refrigerators, crates, piles of trash. Uh, very Eastern Kentucky thing to do. There, there's, a, there's a highway over here and a gravel road off the highway that turned into a dirt road and the dirt road just ended in the woods and here was this big trash pile. But a hundred feet past the trash pile there was a tar paper cabin. Anybody know what I'm talking about? A little cabin, wood frame construction, stoop, porch, stoop, roof, uh, sheets, rolls of tar paper around the sides on the top for the, the siding for the roof. What could go wrong going in there? So we go in there exploring, holes in the floor, holes in the ceiling, 
And what was so cool or interesting was there's a table in there, there's piles of trash in there, glass over here and aluminum. Somebody was collecting, you know, they were recycling, I guess going to the trash pile and recycling. The wall was wallpapered, I kid you not, with newspapers and with cereal boxes folded out and pasted up there. These were older than I was. So like what a cornflakes box looked like in the 60s. It was up there, I found that out, right? We were exploring the interior of this cabin when all of a sudden out of the corner of our eye saw movement. I looked and coming from out behind one of the trash piles was the biggest rat I'd ever seen. It was like a small dog. It looked at us. It smiled, flashed a toothy grin, and we said, we are out of here. We went out of there. We didn't need to be in there any, any longer. That thing could have eaten both of us. Just for a, who's huge, biggest rat I've ever seen in my life. So we thought, you know, enough's enough. We're going back to, back to camp. So we, we reversed our course down the ridge line, shimmied down the cliff, walked down the creek, slid down the waterfall, went all the way back to camp. Told the camp director, he was excited to hear about this. Lee Padgett was his name, he was fascinated. Later we took him. It was one of those things of, guys, how did you get there? <laughs> well, we went that way, because there was, there was no map, there was no trail, we just kinda, we just kinda bushwhacked. But when I told him, okay, we followed the outpost creek as far as we could go, he knew what I was talking about. We climbed the waterfall at the back of it, he knew what I was talking about. Uh, we could give him bearings based on, you know, Eastern Kentucky navigation. Go to the fence, go to the tree, hang a right, hang a left, look for the bull, go the other way. You'll get there, right? Some of you know kind of what I'm talking about. It was a get your bearings moment, and we could actually go back and retrace those steps. So I read this email and thought, wow, they've forgotten where the cabin in the woods is. And I'm too old and fat to take them there, so I guess it's just going to be a mystery for the next generation. I don't know. I don't know. Get your bearings. This scripture, in many ways, is a get your bearings kind of moment. Two thoughts before we come to communion. The first thought is this. On the mountaintop, Jesus took three of his disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And they're up there on the mountaintop. And while they're up there, they see before them appearing Moses and Elijah. Now, now these are two probably of the biggest characters, the biggest people in the Old Testament, Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. And so, from our perspective, they would represent most of what we would understand as being our Old Testament. They kind of represented or encapsulated that. And they're up there with Jesus. And I think we're supposed to read the scripture and kind of get this sense of there was kind of a, some, some bromance going on up here, some man crush going up here, because it seems like Peter, James, and John were like super excited that Moses and Elijah were there. Let's build some tabernacles, some tents. But it also seems that Moses and Elijah were super excited that Jesus was up there, right? It's this get your bearings kind of moment. Peter and the guys are looking to these Old Testament guys. These Old Testament guys are looking to, to Jesus. It, it's a reorienting moment. Who, who is it that God is really revealing here? And of course, a few moments later, after Peter does what Peter does well, he talks, you know, before he thinks and puts his filter on. The cloud comes and the voice comes and says, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. So yes, Moses is there, and yes, Elijah is there, but the voice doesn't say, listen to them. The voice says, this is my son, Jesus, listen to him. So it's this great moment of redirecting. The disciples are looking at Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah are looking to Jesus. The voice from heaven directs them all to Jesus. And then the voice is gone. And the cloud is gone. Must have been an amazing moment. The second bullet point, the second thought is this. Right before this interaction, uh, something else had happened. Now, I think this moment is a link in the chain connecting some important themes in, in the Gospels. When, when Amy read the scripture, it said eight days earlier something had happened, or after eight days, then they went and did this on the mountaintop. Well, what happened eight days earlier? Now, you can go read this for yourselves. You really shouldn't do that, but let me give you a hint. Eight days earlier, Jesus was with his followers, and he was having one of those kind of teaching moments, and he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they responded, well, you know, some say you're a prophet, some say you're this, some say you're that. And then Jesus asked again, he said, no, but who do you, my followers, who do you say that I am? 
And they responded. And then Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, hey, you got it right, but you had some help from my heavenly Father. God revealed this to you. You didn't get this answer on your own, Peter. Good answer, right answer, but you had some help getting that. So there's this moment of, of God revealing this truth through Peter. Peter answering the question, who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the Messiah. And then eight days later, again, this, this moment of get your bearings. From Moses, Elijah, the voice, the cloud, it all points to Jesus. Here's why I think this is important. Let me just offer this to you. The answer to that question, the answer to this kind of picture that the Bible gives us is super important. This question, who, who do we say that he is, is important because, well, let me ask you. You know, don't answer out loud, but in your own life, who, who do you think Jesus is? For some people, maybe he's like a genie in a bottle. You know, rub the lamp three or four times, get a wish. For some people, maybe <clears throat> Jesus is your, your eternal life insurance policy, your, your anti-flame insurance policy. I'm not going to hell, I'll go to heaven, right? For some people, Jesus is our friend. For some people, Jesus is a, a mentor or a guide. For some people, we say he, he is our Lord, our Master, our Savior, right? I, I think the answer to that question, who do we say that he is, is important because of this. How we identify who Jesus is will greatly determine how we listen to him and how we follow him. Let's say it again. How we identify who Jesus is, who do we say that you are, will greatly determine how we listen to him and how we follow him. What I mean is, if Jesus is just a buddy, then we're going to listen to him and follow him a certain way. If he's our get out of jail card, put us back on the straight path card only, that's okay, right? Just more. But then we're going to listen and follow him a certain way. On the other hand, if, if he is Lord and Savior and Master and Messiah, then woo, we listen a whole different way. We follow a whole different way. So, so this question, this mountaintop moment, really is this get your bearings kind of moment. Which way is spiritual north here? Who really are we going to follow? Back to the email, that paragraph. Our journeys in faith can often feel like this, lost, wandering in the woods. So much wandering, no clear direction. But the Christian faith is full of good news. The good news also means that Jesus came before us to show us the way. Part of Lent is reminding us that he walked the path ahead of us and he showed us a life of love and joy and peace and hope. He showed us a life of what it meant to honor the Father with everything in your life. He showed us what it meant to serve others in the name of God. And he showed us what a life of sacrifice looked like and a life of obedience looks like and a life of faithfulness looks like. As we come to the table, to the bread, to the cup. Let's celebrate him for sure. And let's remember him for sure. But today in this season of Lent, let's listen to him and hear again what it means to be faithful. And hear again what it means to be obedient. And hear again what it means to live a life of sacrifice. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you so much. <clears throat> For the example, the witness of Jesus Christ. Lord, in these moments, may we be retuning our hearts and recalibrating our minds to focus on Jesus and none, none other. Lord, may we be full of your Holy Spirit. May we welcome your presence. May we honor this moment and give you thanks for the sacrifice, the sacrament that is before us. Father, we pray that as we come to the table in just a moment, we're reminded of what true obedience looks like and true faithfulness looks like and true sacrifice looks like. As Jesus intentionally walked the path that led him to Jerusalem and led him to the cross on our behalf. Lord, all we can do is say thank you. And all we can do is lift high praises to the holy name of Jesus. It's in his name we ask and pray. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.
if we could have our communion service to come down front, we'll serve our servers first, and then we'll invite the congregation to come. We'll make two lines and come down front and tear off a piece of the bread. You can dip it in the cup of grape juice. The bread, again, reminding us of the body of Christ broken and the cup reminding us of the blood of Christ shed. Friends, the table is open. As the ushers lead, would you come and receive what Jesus has for us today?
please rise as we depart our worship service and let's sing to God again. God, we thank you. And we go from this place carrying your hope and your love and your peace and your joy. We pray, Lord, that as we go through this next week, we would walk as your people, people of faithfulness, people of sacrifice, people of obedience. We pray, Lord, that as people look into our lives this coming week, they might catch a glimpse of you, but because you are inside us and you are what we are all about. All these things we ask and all these things we offer back. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, <coughs> Amen and Amen. God bless you, my friends. Go in peace. Amen.